Hello, everyone. I am, as I was just introduced, Chris Kreitcho. Some of you will know me as the host of New Rust Station, the podcast. We have a little more time than a normal New Rust Station episode, but we also have a boatload to cover. So I will let you stare at this picture of my hilarious, adorable family for a moment longer, and then we'll go. So there are two big ideas I hope all of you get from this talk. Idea number one, anyone can contribute meaningfully. Number two, people can contribute in a variety of ways, a stunning variety of ways, I dare say. The theme here is becoming a contributor because I know for many of us, for me, that can be an intimidating, a challenging, a scary process. It can also be a process that can seem very limited in what it means, and I hope to dispel a lot of that today. In particular, with these two ideas, I want you to come away recognizing that not just even you, but perhaps especially you, can be a contributor to Rust, to whatever other tools you use. There are things you might have to offer, particularly if you're new, or if you're an outsider, or if this is your first time doing this style of programming. There are things you have to offer that someone who's been doing systems programming for 20 years and contributing in open source the entirety of that time doesn't have, because we all have blinders that we get over time, things that we're just inured to and blinded to. So everyone here has something to contribute, and your outsiderness is actually valuable. So anyone, and perhaps especially you. And then secondly, there are so many ways so many ways you can contribute. It's become almost a cliche in this particular community to say that code isn't the only thing that matters. But I want to come away from this talk with you seeing how true that is and you seeing how many other ways there are and how many other needs there are for contributions that aren't code. And I want to preface all of this by asking why. Why this talk? Why should you care? And why do I care? Because there are a lot of things to be passionate about in life. There are a lot of things to be passionate about in the world of software development. And the answer comes down to something that we could phrase as a dichotomy, humanism or technologism. And to, to borrow that language from a developer I admire immensely, Scott Voloshin is a developer in the F Sharp community. And he'll talk in this way and, and he'll say, I'm a humanist more than I am a technologist. The technologies are interesting. Uh, I'm kind of turning into a programming language nerd and I blame Rust. But I'm at the end of the day much more a humanist. I care about Rust not just because type systems are cool, they are, but fundamentally in line with other talks we've heard today because they help people accomplish their goals and they help people solve problems. And in this case, they help people do that safely. That matters. And as software developers, I think we should care about how the tools we use help us serve people more effectively. So, it's not one or the other, but for me, it's more about the humanism. So again, going back to those two big ideas, that anyone can contribute meaningfully, and that people can contribute in a stunning variety of ways, maybe let's mute that so that I don't get another text message from a family member. Do not disturb, thank you. Uh, why these two ideas? And the answer is that I think they're the most applicable of anything I could talk about in that kind of humanism, technologism thing to the people here right now. There are a lot of things we could say about humanism in technology. But here, especially in this community, perhaps especially in this room, we have a big open source focus. And I think these two things serve as lenses into other ideas. So you'll be able to think of applications of the kinds of things I say here to other projects. So with that as background, let's talk about the talk for a moment so you know where we're going because I'm going to cover a lot of ground. We've done the introduction. Now I'm going to say, why bother contributing? Then I'm going to say, who is a contributor anyway? Then I'm going to ask, what's a contribution? How do you contribute? And there's so many things in that category that they literally would not fit on this slide and still be readable, so I didn't put them on this slide. Then we're going to ask, when and where do you contribute? And that's a question that I think we don't often ask, but it's a really helpful one to ask. 
And finally, we'll wrap it all up. And you'll notice this kind of does the grammar school thing, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And hopefully that'll give you a way to hang your hats on it as we cover a lot of material. You'll also note that, that I took them out of order to be convenient and do what I want. So you'll have to deal with that. Why should you bother contributing? Some of us feel very comfortable just sitting and consuming the code. And the answer I have is that there is more work to be done than there are hands to do it. And that's always true. It doesn't matter what project you look at, you'll find lots of open issues on GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket or wherever else because there's a lot of work to be done and there are a lot of things that can be better and that's always true for any project. Any open source maintainer can tell you the truth of this. I've done a little bit of that in the last six months, and wow, there is a lot to do that I just don't have time to get to. I would love the help. And so the people who make the tools that you use every day could probably use your help, and you can help them more than you think. So then, if you're persuaded that, yeah, there's work to do, people need help, am I really cut out to be a contributor? What, who is a contributor anyway? Is it someone who has commit bit in the repository? Is it someone who's a glowing beacon of glorious open source community work who ships a billion lines of code every year? No, actually a contributor is anyone who improves a project. Full stop. For example, we might say someone who submits a patch to fix a typo. And that's a very small example, but it's actually a really important one in my story. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Someone who adds a small correction for a piece of code that's a sample in a project so that someone can actually not make the same mistake they made when they copied code from the readme. Someone who files an issue instead of just suffering in silence through that problem or making a local patch so it works but not upstreaming it. Like, even if you have legal reasons why you can't, you know, actually upstream a patch, you can file an issue that gives someone enough information that they can solve it, that's contributing. All of these things are. And in fact, everything else we're going to talk about today, that's what makes you a contributor, is anyone who improves a project. And I'm not really exaggerating when I say that's how I got started. You can see here what my first contribution to the Rust community is. This is a, a commit to Rust by example, and there was a copy and pasted example from iterator any into iterator find, and, uh, sorry, this is not Rust by example, it's uh, docs for the APIs. And it had the wrong word in the description. So I literally fixed one word in the description and then I got the awesome Rust High Five bot that came out and said, you're, we're so happy you're here. And it got merged and I said, I can actually contribute something to this community. This is barely over two years ago. I'm a relatively well-known voice, literally voice from the podcasting in the community. The reason I felt like I could do that is because of this commit. I got to contribute to Rust and hopefully smooth the path for a few people because of that commit. So again, who is a contributor? Well, it's all of us if we're chipping back in and adding things and improving things in the tools we use. I don't think most of you who are already open source contributors probably have stories very different from mine. You found a small thing to fix somewhere and you did. And now you might be particularly skilled at that thing. If you're looking around, you might see someone who's particularly skilled at that thing, but this is how everyone starts, small. You see a need, you fill it, and then ultimately by keeping at it for a long time, you get somewhere. And particularly in open source, when you do that, you get this feeling of helping people that's good. And I think there's a reason for that. We're meant as humans to help each other. And we're broken, so we don't always do that, but we should aspire to, we should help each other. It's good. So when we say who's a contributor, it's anyone who improves a project. And that's really all there is to it. Sometimes we want to quibble with that definition. But I think the main reasons we tend to quibble are ego, they're turf defending, they're wanting to prop up ourselves and make our own contributions feel like the most important or the most valuable. Uh, I like the way someone famous put it in something I read recently, which is anyone who would be first must be last. 
must be the servant of all. And I hope I evince that attitude, and I would encourage all of you to evince that attitude. Be servants of the people around you. When we stop worrying about turf marking and building up our own prestige and start rejoicing in the ways that we can help each other, even if they look, and sometimes perhaps especially if they look different from our own ways, our projects get better, and in small ways, but real ways, the world gets better. The last thing, I hope this encourages you to remember, there's no magic to being a contributor. Again, you just chip in where you have skills that can help. And all of you have skills that can help. So what and how can you contribute? This is a very, very long list, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on any particular detail, but I hope it helps you come away from here feeling like I can do one of the things on this list. We'll start with the obvious one. You can write code. And there are a lot of ways you can write code. You can fix bugs, you can implement features, you can look for open issues and go after it, and you should. Writing code is fun, that's why most of us are here, because we like doing that. And we want to empower each other to do that. You'll find tags like this. So even if it's your first time contributing, you look for an e-mentor tag or an e-easy tag. On other non-core Rust projects, you'll see things like good first issue. If you've never written a line of open source before, pick these. Go into the mentoring ones and say, look, I would love to contribute to Rust itself. Will someone teach me how? And it's got a mentor tag on it. The answer is yes, we will teach you how. I also want to emphasize, we don't swear at people or call them names in this community when we make mistakes. Because you know what? We're all humans and we all make mistakes. And it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. I've been writing software for about a decade. I make mistakes every day. And we don't insult each other over that. And that's a big deal. So don't feel intimidated like that's how it's going to go. We want to help you. <laughs> We've got these tags here because we want to help you contribute. We want you to recognize that you can do this. But I'm going to caveat all of that, as good as it is, by saying code is not the only thing. It's not even necessarily the most important contribution you can make in any given project. It's just the most obvious one because what we're talking about is software. So here are all the other things that you can do to contribute, and sometimes they'll be more important. I mentioned this earlier. You can file bugs. And this is actually one of the most important things you can do and one of the easiest things you can do. I'll tell you a secret. If the person who shipped the library doesn't already have an open issue for your bug, they probably don't know about it. Which means that the only way they can fix it is if you tell them. So please, file an issue on something. Now, I opened this to RipGrep, and as it turns out, I've never actually run into a bug with RipGrep. I'm sure there are some. I saw some open issues. But I opened this one intentionally because it's one that I've never had to file an issue on. But you know what? If I run into a bug with RipGrep, well, Burnt Sushi wants me to file an issue and tell him so he can fix it. Two, docs. And we're going to spend a little while on this one. You're probably, as a developer, already on board with the importance of documentation, at least in principle, because undocumented or badly documented projects are terrible to use. You show up and you say, what, what do I do with this? And then you say, I don't know. Presumably, I connect to a database with it, but there's no documentation, so how do I do that? And you fight with it, and you fight with it, and you fight with it. It's, it's bad. So contributing here is one of the easiest ways that you can add to a project going beyond that filing issues step. It's also harder in a lot of ways than writing the code is because it's all about communicating. Now, why you rather than the implementer? And the answer is that the explanation of how things work under the hood is something an implementer is probably always going to be relatively good at. They implemented it, they know how it works. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're the best at explaining how to start with it because they already have it all in their heads. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best at writing API docs for the same reason. Learning materials for the same reason. Sometimes someone coming in trying to use the project is actually better equipped to help communicate those things because they're going through the process of learning it themselves. They know what the pain points are. So if you feel like, yeah, but I have no idea how to write documentation, well, there are actually three easy steps to write good basic documentation for anything. One, as you're going, write down the things you don't understand. So if you're working through a library and you're trying to figure out how to call an API, write it down. Say, I don't know how this works. 
and write down the specific things that you don't know how they work. And then, two, when you figure them out, write that down too. And what you have just done is say, here's a problem, here's the solution that solves it using this API. You just wrote docs. Three, don't keep the docs to yourself. File an issue, open a PR, share it with everyone else. And suddenly, everyone else who was going to hit that same pain point, they're not going to anymore because you just solved it for them. Now, in the realm of documentation, there's a lot more than API docs. There are API docs, and we should write those, and we should be grateful that a lot of Rust projects have API docs, and you should turn on the lint that will make the compiler error if you don't have documented items, and then you shouldn't lie to the compiler by just putting a documentation item on it even though it's empty. <laughs> Document your stuff, please. But readmes, readmes are documentation, and they're usually first people's first encounter with your code. Tutorials. If you can write a good tutorial that shows someone the even just the very basics of how to get going with your code base, that takes you a long way toward people being able to actually build something with it. API docs don't tell me how to fit the pieces of the API together. A tutorial does. Books. Books sound scary and intimidating because they're long. And that's true, they are, they are hard. But not every book is the Rust programming language version two. A lot of books are much smaller I see you looking at me back there, Steve. Uh, you can do like Daniel Keep did and wrote the little book of Rust macros in Rust 1.0. That's a great guide if you want to learn how to write macros. You can, if you're sitting down and writing and finding that you have a lot to say or an area where there isn't a lot of documentation, you can write a book and use MDBook or LeanPub or any number of ways to put it up there and be useful to people without going through the big publisher side of things. And that's really useful. Finally, and this one's dear to my heart, and in 2018, as part of the push for Rust 2019, I'm going to be hammering at this, chip in on the Rust reference. There are a lot of parts of the language that are only documented in RFCs. That stinks. It's really hard to know about them if you have to go trolling through RFCs to figure them out. So chip in on things like the Rust reference, and you'll find similar things in other communities, in other projects, in other languages. Translation is also really valuable with documentation, and I want to come at this from two directions. One, English is sort of assumed as the standard language, especially by Americans, but an awful lot of people in the world don't speak English, and for an awful lot more, let me say that backwards, most people in the world don't speak English, and for an awful lot of those who do, English is a second language and it's a lot of work. So if you can provide a localized version of documentation, that's an enormous win. It makes it far more accessible to more people. And by the flip side, there are brilliant developers who speak every language, and a lot of them have to learn enough English to get by. But look, if you speak Amharic, and you know some Ethiopian developers who are churning out fabulous libraries, but they're not that comfortable writing English, translate for them. And all of a sudden, you're making you're taking advantage of the fact that English is this sort of lingua franca to popularize things out of other language communities to make them broadly accessible. Those kinds of things are huge. And we don't do enough of it. So please, if you know languages, unlike me, I know classical Greek and biblical Hebrew, and no one's asking for documentation in those for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. Plato, you know, you'd think he'd be interested in this stuff, but he's kind of dead. The language in this slide is very precise for a reason. I gave a version of this talk before and someone thought I was talking about the language design. I was like, no, 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 no. The visual design for a lot of our things needs work. Uh, the language design is great, but the visual design for things like the landing page or documentation. I was having a conversation with someone earlier today who said, it's just kind of a wall of text. I don't know what to do with it because he was just getting started. And I think that's a feeling many of us have had. It's also a problem that people are actively working on. Rust doc the next is coming. But I mean, it's a lot of work to do this kind of stuff. So you can help and you can perhaps especially help if you have some talent for visual design. Because let's be honest. Most systems programmers, historically, it's not what they're interested in. They're interested in like how kernels work. And while there's sometimes some overlap, 
that's not historically how it's been likeliest to be. But we don't have to let that be the final say. Carol said in the keynote earlier that Rust can be an enabling technology. I agree with her about that. So what we ought to do is instead of saying, well, we're just system programmers, we don't care about that, we should instead do what we try to do all the time here and bend the curve and make Rust stand out in this area, make things easy to access, easy to understand. So how do you do that? Well, if you're a person who does actually have some affinity for design, whether you're an expert who's coming in because your background was designed but you decided to switch careers and Rust looks interesting or you're just a talented amateur, pitch in. We could really use help in this area. There's an Impel period Rust 2017 project to improve the homepage. We need your help. If you've got good HTML and CSS chops, please chip in. And if you're just flat bad at design, and you know what, it's okay to be just flat bad at design, please don't let that be an excuse to put up something in Times New Roman with no styles that's impossible to read. Use something like Bootstrap, or use one of these frameworks. I poked around a little yesterday. They're very minimal CSS frameworks. Some of them don't make you even write any classes on your HTML. They just style your elements nicely. So you can literally just write Markdown and pump it out and put a link href style sheet in the head of your HTML. And you're going to have something that's way easier to digest because whether you want to call it irrational or not, I would not, but we do respond to visual design. Things that are attractive matter. One reason that Rocket.rs made a huge splash when it came out is because it has a really snazzy website and it looks awesome and it makes you want to use it. And I actually think that's a good thing in how humans are built, but even if you don't, recognize that it is part of how humans are built and like I said, use one of these. I also want you to think about what designers will sometimes call information hierarchy, or you might call an outline. How you structure the content on your website matters. It makes it more or less comprehensible to people. So think about how you put stuff together. That will go a lot longer and a lot further than you might realize. Next up, let's talk about blogging. I know, no one blogs anymore, we tweet thread. Please blog, please. Code samples work a lot better in blogs, just saying. <laughs> I know blogging feels hard to people because writing is hard work and writing words to communicate to people is not the same thing as writing software even to communicate to other people. They're different skills and so this may feel really hard at first but it doesn't have to be amazing. You can just start and you'll get better with practice. You may never be T.S. Eliot but you'll get better with practice. I want to describe blogging on easy mode, and it's basically something I've already said, but I want you to take away that it really is just this simple. Write down what you're learning. And so that process that you use for writing docs and sending pull requests is the same. Write a blog post in which you say, I didn't know this thing, now I kind of know this thing, here's my summary of it. And even if you get some friendly correction from people, you'll have helped others process that same new idea. And you'll get some Google foo and people will go searching for answers to that question and you'll have helped other people through that process. And I wanna give you two good examples to go look up of totally different styles of doing this. One of them is, and I hope I say her name right, apologies if I don't, Vaidehi Joshi, who's written a series called Basex on her Medium site. And this is basically just introduction to concepts in computer science, algorithms, data types, etc. This has been really helpful for me in part because I don't have a computer science background. I have a physics degree. I've learned this all as I go. This kind of stuff is awesome for me and it's very detailed and it's great review even if you have a CS degree but it's 20 years old. Also Julia Evans who's probably the best what I just learned writer I have ever read and she's hilarious and she has great comic illustrations. You don't have to be as good as either of them. Suffice it to say there's a lot of ways you can do this. You can do one-off things, or you can write like I did an 18-part series comparing Rust and Swift from the perspective of a beginner at both. There's flexibility here. <laughs> you can talk about a particular technology. You can introduce it. You can do a deep dive on using it. You can explain how it's built. You can, and this is actually really, really valuable, especially when you do it kindly. You can critique and highlight problems with things. I know that one of the things that's been helpful for Tokyo's iteration and its design is getting helpful critical feedback. 
We need that. Nothing is perfect when we first ship it. So critique kindly with the intent to help rather than to beat down. We need that. You can demonstrate how to integrate different parts of the ecosystem. One of the Rust Reach projects ended up including a blog post that says, here's how you use Rocket and Diesel to build a blog. That was great, and it answered questions I had about how to do exactly that. You can also use blog posts to invite feedback on your own projects and say, here's something I did. What do you think? And people will give you good input. One that's very near and dear to my heart, audio and video. People like getting things in ways that aren't just words. We need noises and pictures, too. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about podcasts. I get critiques sometimes of, I just, why don't you just write this as a, a script? And for one thing, the scripts are out there. But for another, not everyone learns the same way. Some people hearing things makes it click. And also, lots of people have commutes, and I can't read on a commute. Now, some people can because they're on a subway and they can look at their phone or whatever. But for a lot of people, they're stuck in traffic in a car for 20 minutes, and you can listen to a podcast there. To which you might say, but there are already podcasts. And I would say, yes, there are. There's mine. But you know what? One podcast really isn't enough. There's a lot of stuff going on in Rust. And you say, yeah, but look, there are two. There's also requests for explanation. And I say, yeah, but really, there's a lot going on in Rust. Two podcasts is not enough podcasts. And you say, look, Jonathan Turner just started Rusty Spike. There's three podcasts already. And I say, you know what? These cover a lot of ground. We need more podcasts. Try doing tutorials for all sorts of things. Try doing non-tutorials. Try being the most awesome interview podcast. There are options. Please podcast. Same thing with video. Again, people have different learning styles. I heard often from people that Railscast was amazing. This is how I got started with Rails. We could use Railscast for Rust. So if you have skills with video, Please use them. We need them. And again, there are options here. You can make screencasts. You can live stream yourself working on open source. Sean Griffin has done that for Diesel a couple of times, and it's neat. Pair with somebody and stream that. I'm sure you can think of more. The point is make video and share it around. It's really helpful as a resource, and we don't have a lot of it for Rust yet. Not least, talk to people. You can do that online, IRC, Gitter, discourse, you name it, Slack, etc. Do it online. Rust does a lot of this. But also do it in person. Do it at meetups and conference because physicality matters. And you all are already persuaded of this. You're at a conference. But if anyone out there is watching online, be persuaded of this. Meetups and conferences help a lot. And they especially help a lot of making you feel like, OK, I'm not alone. Because as great as the internet is, sometimes it's isolating. Go to a meetup. Found a meetup. Help a meetup start founder. The last thing I want to say is to those of you who've been doing this for a while, and in the Rust community, I, I see this mostly. All of you old timers still have things to contribute, but some of the most important is continuing to be welcoming as you are and mentoring, because getting started is hard. And so taking your talents and your knowledge and investing them in new people is actually sometimes more effective and has a multiplicative effect you can do a lot more by helping 10 people get up to speed and be productive than you can yourself, even if you're one of those magical 10x wizard unicorn programmers. The last thing I want to say is when and where do you contribute? And I want to put this two ways. Where are you in the process of being comfortable with contributing? Are you just getting started or are you already comfortable? If you're just getting started, again, look for these. And pick big projects, because they're the ones most equipped to help new people get started. Believe it or not, Servo and Rust-C are probably easier places to chip in in some ways, because they have the infrastructure to help you. Then, if you're already experienced, the, the flip side is the case. Find smaller projects, and pick something that just looks interesting to you, which could use the help, because you're going to be able to contribute and help with a lot less of the mentoring, and you can add the most value there. Remember, there's always more work than hands, so projects need you. And then the other question to ask is about project life cycles. Where is a given project? Look, if it's a small project that's basically done, pick something else to work on. If something is really solid but needs a lot of docs, write docs. If there's big projects which have a billion needs, think about your talents and the things you enjoy and find a way to chip in there. Back to where we started. Anyone, and I do mean anyone, can contribute meaningfully. I hope everyone in this room running through that list 
has thought at least once, you know, that is actually a thing I could do. I, I, I know how to do that thing. Or I haven't done that yet, but I could. And I hope you remember all those different ways, or at least one of all of those different ways that you can contribute and you can make a difference to the success of this project, of particular tools within the ecosystem that you use, et cetera. Here are a short list of places that you might go to find more info on places to contribute. The impl period is going on right now for Rust, and it is a great time with a lot of focus on people contributing. So I hope you go contribute. If you're flying home, find, find a project to see what its state is and maybe write some docs on the plane. Thank you.